So welcome back, uh, Megan, Deep. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So uh, you have moved around quite a lot. You work yeah. for LinkedIn. You ran Google in Asia Pacific. Uh, some startups. Lots of things. Was that kind of opportunistic, or, or was there a plan? Well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get back to it. But first of all, I want to say this: this is like the coolest conference I've ever been to because. One of the items on my bucket list was always to be on a late night TV show in America. I don't think I'll ever get there, but I got the band. So that's like pretty cool, right? That's what happens there when a guest shows up, they play the band. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, one of the things, Ludwig, I, I'm a big believer in that uh, talk is cheap, action is what really matters. And when I truly believe in something, I go all out and I bet my career on it. So I was in graduate school in 99. And 100 of my classmates wanted to start companies because it was the big dot-com boom. And then April of 2000 happened, and 90 of them decided that their job with Goldman Sachs or McKinsey was probably better. Uh, and I was amongst the 10 that went on to start a company because I really believed in starting the company. And in 2002, uh, after I had uh, you know, transitioned from my company, everyone thought that consumer internet was dead. And that's when I went to Google, because I really believe that that is when consumer internet would start, because a lot of things had come together. And in 2008, even as Google was seeing success after success, uh, I saw in Asia that social media and social internet was really taking steam and actually getting more usage than search. And I decided to go to this little uh, tiny company called LinkedIn with 300 people at that time, um, and was there for another six years since then. Very cool. I mean, I have to say one thing. Uh, uh, there's one thing we can talk about. I mean, you probably are very interested to hear about the um, SoftBank Vision Fund, $100 billion. But unfortunately, Deep can't talk about this. I mean, you can try to corner him after this talk and, and, and extract some information, but he can't disclose or whatever. Right. Or, yeah. But you have a talk prepared five minutes. Um, we've heard about AI. We've heard about aviation. We've heard about 3D printing. Now we're going to hear something about bioengineering. Yeah, so, uh, let's, let's do that. So the second half of the chessboard is a phrase that I have co-opted from Ray Kurzweil. And for those of you who don't know, Ray Kurzweil is one of the preeminent futurists in the Valley. And currently works as the chief futurist at Google. And he talked about it from the perspective of technology strategy. And this term actually comes from an ancient Indian astronomer who was talking about geometric progression. So imagine the following. There's a chessboard, and you put one grain of rice on the first square, two grains of rice on the second square, four grains of rice on the third square, and so on. And very soon, you get to the 32nd square. And what you see here is 4.3 billion grains, because that's the power of geometric progression. That's kind of fascinating, but then you count it, and it's only 100 kilos of rice. Not that big a deal, honestly, because just in Munich during Oktoberfest last year, people consumed six million, 7 million liters of wheat beer, which was produced with 3.4 million kilograms of wheat, of barley. So that's a lot more than just 100 kilograms of rice. But now, the power of the second half of the chessboard takes on. You get to the 54th square, and all of a sudden, you're talking about 461 million metric tons of rice. That's the entire production of rice in the world in 2010. And then you get to the last square, the 64th square, and that's 1,000 times more than all the rice that we've ever produced. This is the power of exponential laws. The power of exponents is super important. And all of us have been experiencing this power of exponent for the last 50 years. Many of us understand it. Many of us just accepted it. And that was Moore's law. In the 40 years between 71 and 2011, the number of transistors that, that we put on chips doubled every two years. What did this create? Just the semiconductor business itself went from a $3 billion a year business to $330 billion a year business. But more importantly, according to the Semiconductor Industry Association, this business generates $400 billion of other value every year. Now, usually industry groups, we all know, like to inflate the value that their industry creates, because then you get more power in regulation and politics. But I think that here they're underrepresenting it. Because imagine 50 years ago, 
someone went to sleep and they just woke up yesterday, they would be completely flabbergasted at the world they see. Nothing, including this simple clicker to this most powerful device that we keep in our pockets, they could have ever envisioned 50 years ago. And all of that has happened because of Moore's law. What I want to talk about today is actually another law that is even more powerful than Moore's law that has been creeping into our lives over the last 15 years. And that's how quickly the cost of sequencing the human genome has gone down in the last 15 years alone, from $100 million to $1,000, 100,000 times. In fact, last week, an announcement came out from Illumina that makes these machines that sequences human genomes, that in the next few years, that cost is going to go down to $100, a million times lower than just 15 years ago. That's actually faster than Moore's Law's progress. What does this mean to us? It means healthier babies, better products, and less disease. So I'm going to make a bold proclamation today that in 10 years when we come back to DLD in 2027, everything that we know about digital, about life, about design will be completely different and better than we've ever thought about. So if you take a pill tonight and go to bed and come back 10 years later, you're not going to recognize what this world looks like. That is the power of bioinformatics. That is going to be the power of genomics. And it's completely infusing our life, even as we think about it. Thanks, Deep. Uh, now, now let, me, let me be a bit contrarian here. Sure. Uh, you're I mean, German. We, you have to be contrarian. Yes, true. Yes. <laughs> Uh, skeptical, contrarian, all that. Uh, we don't like GM food. We don't like bioengineering. Okay. Um, but, I mean, these, these, these exponentials, they're very alluring, kind of Moore's law, low-hanging fruit, it, kind of costless innovation. It's kind of like paradise. Uh, it, will it be that easy with bioengineering, bioinformatics? I mean, you, it's much more complex. Um, there are all kinds of problems. I mean, what can go wrong? Well, you know, just like when we... When someone first came up with the knife, the surgeon used it to you know, make sick people better, and the psychopaths used it to kill other people. So clearly, a lot of things can go wrong if fallen in the, right, in the wrong hands. And a lot of things can go right if they are used in the right way and appropriately. Uh, you know, I'm a technologist, and I'm very pure-minded from that perspective. Like My job is to make sure that we invent and discover new things, and society generally catches up with the right kinds of rules and fair use and good use practices along with it. Let's hope that, but your, your metaphor of the, kind of the second half of the chessboard, which is great, because I think it, it, it goes to the core of the whole thing. Where are we at? I mean, if, if, are we on kind of square 14 or square 35 no, when it comes to bioengineering? Yeah, yeah. I, I think we are clearly beyond square 32 yeah. at this point, yeah. Because okay. we, we are doing, you know, right now, I, I know that it's not allowed by law in Germany, but in the US, if you are over the age of 35 and having a child, uh, no OBGYN ever makes you do an amniocentesis. Because amnio, while it you know, tries to figure out if your baby is going to be healthy or not, is also very invasive. It can have false negatives and lead you to the wrong decisions. Instead, they take 10 milliliters of blood and they sequence that blood to see if your baby is healthy. And it has completely changed the psychology of having babies later in life, which is becoming more a fact of life, right? So that wasn't possible five years ago. And all of this, it's, it, the shoes that I showed, by the way, were not some conceptual shoes. They were uh, you know, something that Adidas just launched. They are made, they are completely compostable. They're made of artificial spider silk. That's one of the strongest materials out there and also very light. Now, I don't even want to give people nightmares of thinking, how do you farm spiders? Okay, <laughs> and harvest spider silk from them. But this was all done through genetics. And it, it is, you know, the mosquitoes, like Zika virus, right now the best antidote to Zika virus is to actually use the mosquitoes against themselves and genetically engineer them so that they produce a protein that will kill them. So, you know, we are clearly beyond square 32 at this point, mm -hmm. and in a very good way. 
No, you showed this, this, this kind of the cost curve for sequencing, which is obviously going down. Yeah. What about kind of synthesizing DNA? Is, is that solved too? Does that kind of, if you design, or you want to change yeah. uh, our organisms, kind of you design that and then you have to implement that. Is, is that, that as easy as cheap? Uh, yeah, so synthesizing DNA right now is as easy as deciding what sequence of ACGT you want and emailing it to companies like an IDT, like a Synthego, like a Twist Bioscience, and literally a few weeks later in the mail, you get like this vacuum sealed test tube with that DNA. And then you can use it to do whatever it is that you want to do with it. Mm. When we talked yesterday, you also talked about kind of using DNA as storage. I mean, is that? Uh... Yeah. So, uh, you know, Satya talked about AI today, but a cool project that Microsoft is doing uh, with a company called Twist Bioscience is uh, they've figured out that, you know, this one little really small amount of DNA actually carries a lot of information. So the human genome, when you completely sequence it, is three terabytes of data. And that's all contained in a very small fragment of our DNA that we synthesize. So what they have done is they said, instead of base two, which is how we encode all files today, which is zeros and ones, if we encode them into base four, so they effectively become ACGT, you can then you know, store them in DNA. So you can encode, you can create the synthetic DNA with whatever it is that you want. And they took a whole book, which is several hundred pages, and made this into like something so small that you can't even see it with the naked eye. And you can take the entire world's data, which by the way is doubling every year, and put it and make hundreds of copies. And DNA is very stable. Uh, it can go to very low temperatures. It does not get destroyed like tape. And you can make lots and lots of copies and keep it around. But it's very slow in terms of reading at this point. It right? is slow in terms of reading right now. It is also error prone in terms mm. of reading it. And you know, those are the kinds of problems that will get solved. So that's why this is still a lab technology and not in production. Okay. Now, bioinformatics, <laughs> bioengineering, and AI kind of seem, seem a good fit. Yeah. I was wondering, could you give me, I mean, are there companies actually using AI uh, uh, in that area and kind of coming up with something interesting, actually? Yeah, and this is why, you know, I'm an engineer by background. I almost became a doctor like 30 years ago, but, you know, some shift of fate moved me into engineering. Uh, but the reason I got reinterested in this area about six or seven years ago was because I saw how computation was completely changing life sciences. So computational biology is now inextricably linked. And you're seeing this a lot in terms of this three terabytes of data I talked about. Well, how do you parse that data? That informatics is not easy to do. And techniques such as machine learning, advanced statistical processing, deep learning even, where you don't have a lot of models, but you're trying to extract interesting patterns from this data are becoming super important. There are several companies, including some in our portfolio that are using it. Mm. I mean, you recently invested, uh, SoftBank did, in yeah. or part of the deal uh, in a company called Zymogen. Yeah. T tell me more about that. So Zymogen is a really cool company. And uh, you know, it may freak out some of you guys to know that most of the common things that we use in a household, say a perfume that has the scent of a rose, uh, vanilla extract that they may use in cooking or baking, uh, most, more likely than not, did not come from pure rose petals or pure vanilla. It comes from industrial products. And 30 years ago, the way you would create these products was as a byproduct of refining petroleum. So olefins you know, are the ones that give us that uh, sense of smell, et cetera. Um, what you find out that that has a very bad environmental footprint, and it's also very expensive because the price of oil goes up and down. And it's, you know, it's not that simple to do. So about 10 years ago, people figured out that you could actually program bacteria to produce these olefins and to produce a lot of industrial products if you fed them enough sugar. So the quid pro quo is you feed them sugar, put them in giant vats, and they produce car hydrocarbons, which become the raw materials. Then what you found out was this is a very slow and laborious process, and the bacteria can only do so much. So Zymogen, what they do is they genetically engineer the microbes so that they can produce more of what you want more efficiently. Take less sugar, give out more hydrocarbons of the right kind for you. And they use robotics and a lot of machine learning to do this a lot more efficiently than the existing processes do. Is that, is, is Zymogen is kind of a typical example for the company you're looking for, or is, I mean, just give me kind of a robo profile of, yeah. of, 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 so of the deal. So in general, at SoftBank, we are looking, and uh, particularly my team uh, globally, is looking for deep technology companies. So things that are really about the second half of the chessboard. In fact, this morning was great, because these are all the kinds of technologies that we look at. 
And that will change the way we live and work over the next 10 to 20 years. Because you know, we are very patient capital and very long-term investors. Um, in the genomic space, uh, the way we mapped it out is really foundational technology. So one investment we have is 10x genomics that works alongside sequencing technologies and really helps you do better, less error-prone sequencing. Uh, then diagnostics on top of it. So we have an investment called Garden Health that does liquid biopsies for cancer, which, by the way, if you ever know anyone who's had cancer, uh, you know how painful it is to just get a tissue biopsy done. And a lot of times it's error-prone. If you have, say, lung cancer, you have a 20 plus percent chance that you die of your lung collapsing because the surgeon punctured your lung as opposed to getting the right tissue sample. If instead, again, you can take a 10 milliliter of blood sample and just test that to know which tissue has the cancer and what stage and what mutation, uh, it changes the regimen you are under quite a bit. And then the industrial uh, biology company uh, that I talked about, which is Zymogen. And so adjacencies to it. So we're also looking for companies in biostatistics in this space, for example, because we believe that pure play machine learning and deep learning is going to become very important uh, in the field of genomics. But these are, I think, pretty major investments. I mean, Simogen, I think yeah. that was 130 million. So it's not like your social media or app startup, a few thousand dollars. And, and, no, we and are not dabbling, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but is, is that, is that going to happen? I mean, that's, I mean, you could imagine DNA in a way, software, uh, once you figure that out, you could have like little startups doing their thing, and um, is, is that the model? I mean, there's, there's um, a series of bio startups, bio hacker spaces, that's kind of the model they have in mind. Yeah, I mean, they, there could be some of that, especially in the bioinformatics space. Yeah. But in a lot of other things, this is not like, you know, you have like three really smart engineers, they spin up an AWS or an Azure instance in the sky, and you know, they get like some freelance uh, web dev and design help from 99designs, and voila, you get Snapchat, right? So th this is harder science, this takes a lot of time, and also more importantly, you're sell like Zymogen selling into Fortune 50 companies, and those sales cycles are long, you have to really understand what business they are in, and help them grow their bottom line. So, you know, those are harder problems to solve just from a commercial standpoint. Now, there have been previous attempts of, of doing this, kind of producing new materials using uh, uh, biotechnology and all that. And they developed the prototypes, but then kind of scaling the business turned out to be really, really yeah. tough. So what do you think is different now? I mean, what's, what's kind of the enabling technology which will allow you to mass produce shoes that, that kind of dissolve themselves so when you it, throw them it away. Is, I think that's a, that's a very good way of thinking about it. And in the first half of the chessboard, we had some of the sequencing and other things. A, they were expensive, but then B, a lot of the computational techniques and a lot of the robotics techniques were not being infused together. So today, the canonical of a great genomic or a biotech startup is not just a few biologists coming together, but the smart biologists coming together with the smart roboticist that's coming together with the smart data science person together. And when we, you know, it's not even cross-functional, it's multifunctional company. And when those things come together, that's when magic is starting to happen, and that's what's different now. Because, you know, computational people like me are getting interested in biology, biologists are getting interested in computation. Like 10 years ago, in American universities, uh, the following major did not exist, computational biology. Right now, it's one of the three hottest majors in universities, right? Young kids in college right now want to study that field because you know, it helps them use the left and the right brain, bring it all together, and create something that's massively impactful. Okay, uh, last question, and uh, I, I let my inner German come out here again. <laughs> uh, so, so just imagine you, 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 get, you get pitched on a company and you see the product could be really dangerous, kind of little animals could escape the, the lab and, and yeah. destroy humanity. I mean, would, would you still invest in, in, in that company? I mean, we talked about ethics and AI. Sure. Ethics in bioengineering, uh, bioinformatics, I think are even more important. So. Yeah, you know, eth ethics are important. If someone came to us and said, look, we are going to generate, you know, have the perfect genetically engineered army that will destroy the world, me morally would say no, I'm not interested in that. Look, I, I come, you know, I, I've been trained in companies like Google that for the longest time, and I think still, do not take advertising for hard liquor. Okay, because, and cigarettes, because they believe that morally it was incorrect for us to be doing that. So uh, now the ethics in this area, though, I also want to caution, are very different. You know, in the US, George W. Bush, when he was president, would not even allow stem cell research. Whereas in Korea, 
you know, if your pet dog has died, you can actually get an exact replica made for $100,000, and that's okay and legal, and there's a company that has been doing it for many years. And in China, as we heard yesterday from Julian and Ian uh, from Oxford University, they are enabling you know, genetic editing on human beings. So as a society, I don't think we've come to a common conclusion and what the ethics are of the space. And what I would suggest, you know, again, as a technologist to all the ethicists and policymakers in the room, is get on this bandwagon and start moving fast because the technology is moving with or without you. And I think the sooner we start talking about these topics and coming to a common understanding globally, the better off we will be as humanity. Great. Thank you very much, Deep. That was cool. Please come back next year and talk to us about the Vision Fund.